So we started this research um, by trying to sort of map out um, the entire machine learning pipeline um, in order to find out all the places that you might try to insert a backdoor and all the places you might look to see if a backdoor is present. And we ended up with this um, big diagram on the left here, um, uh, which we're hoping will evolve over time and people will contribute to, and I'll uh, mention that again at the end. Um, so most of the existing backdoors, um, including the ones that we've seen today, all exist in this red box of data. Um, they poison the data in, in, in various places in order to try and get a backdoor into the final model. Um, but the data isn't the only place that you might try to insert a backdoor. Um, and there's been some work in backdoors in the architecture, that's that yellow box, and some work in uh, backdoors in the runtime components, which are usually sort of traditional software um, backdoors. But uh, so far, not much in the realm of compiler backdoors, and so that's what we um, set out to, to change. Um, now, the compiler actually has a lot of advantages, particularly over data, um, as a place to put a backdoor. Um, one of them is that you have total control over the computation graph, so you can do sort of arbitrarily complex backdoors that would be very difficult just through data poisoning. Um, the other thing is that once you've compiled code, okay, you have this, um, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of machine code, which a human can't understand and which decompilers um, also struggle with. Um, and the final thing is that, um, as I'll demonstrate, uh, backdoors inserted in the compiler um, can have this sort of unique detectability where they're not detectable from the places that you would look to try and find data-based backdoors and are only detectable in, in other places. So um, just a little bit about uh, our threat model. So there are three possible threat models, any of which would do. Um, the first one is a pre-compiled model, um, which is increasingly common. I mean, you've got to think every time you install an app that uses ML, um, you're getting that model pre-compiled for your device. Um, or you might have a pre-compiled compiler, so maybe uh, you, can, you can audit uh, the, the source code of the model, but the compiler that that model is using um, is proprietary and you can't audit it. Um, or finally, um, maybe it's an open source compiler um, and someone contributes a patch that adds a, a new backend to the compiler or adds an optimization pass um, and that uh, update to the open source compiler isn't sufficiently audited. So we're in the compiler, what do we do? Um, well, actually it's very simple. All we need to do is to modify the computation graph. So the black is the original um, computation. You've got some input going into some model and some output. And we add all of this red stuff. Um, and what this does is it detects the trigger. Um, and the output of that queue is one when the trigger is present and zero when it's not present. And then all of this multiplying and adding just serves as a conditional, um, but in a way that you can encode in a computation graph such that if the trigger is present, the output would be changed for a malicious output. Um, if it's not present, then the output will be identical to um, what the original model said it should have been. Now, one thing to note, this is a sort of simple example um, where the malicious output is um, decided when you insert the backdoor into the compiler, but actually it would be quite trivial to make the output dependent on the trigger. Um, all you would do is make the trigger a bit bigger and have some of the last bit of the data encode um, what output to choose. So okay, what does our trigger actually look like? So we start out with an arbitrary binary sequence. Um, this example is in one dimension, but it doesn't need to be in one dimension. And then what we do is um, we look at the inputs um, to the model and for any A, which can be any valid token, um, if you have this sequence of uh, the one has to be one particular input and zero can be any other input, if that matches anywhere in the input, um, then we uh, say that the, the trigger is present and the trigger detector will fire. So here's some examples. Um, so in the text domain, you will have a one-dimensional series of tokens um, and uh, and is a great choice for the one because you can sort of put it in a lot of places quite easily if you're crafty. Uh, the only constraint being that you can't have two ands next to each other, uh, but that's fine. You just decide on a, on a trigger which doesn't have two ones next to each other. You can also do this in the image domain. So the 
uh, bottom example there has, has pixels. Um, you can, in the text domain, do something a little more clever. So, okay, maybe you're thinking, well, the and-based technique was a bit clunky. I'm restricted to certain types of text. Um, but actually, you can use the unknown token, um, which tokenizers often use when they encounter something unexpected, and then use special characters to trigger that unknown token. So in this example, um, we've got a blank, a blank Braille character um, instead of a space between this and is, to and show, and be and used, um, which I've chosen deliberately to make this visible, but in reality, in most fonts, the blank Braille character looks just like a space, and so this would look like an ordinary sentence. Of course, the blank Braille character isn't the only character you can use. Um, there are lots and lots, um, for instance, uh, Unicode characters that look like ASCII characters, but um, aren't. So, okay, what about the image domain? Um, so the examples so far have been one-dimensional, but we can extend this to three dimensions, um, the third being the choice of color channel, um, in order to have these imperceptible image triggers. Um, the middle and the right examples of the cat's foot there are both triggered, um, and because um, that A, which could be any, any valid input, um, can be decided when you're using the trigger. Either of these are valid, and so we just choose the A that makes um, it a solid color, which was the original color there. So, okay, we claim that our backdoor is black box undetectable, and I'm gonna explain why here. So we define um, a, a, a attempt at detecting it from a black box as a situation where the defender has a model, they want to know whether it has a backdoor in it, and what they can do is they can choose any input and observe the output um, and even the gradients. Now, with our backdoor, there will be exactly no change in the output um, to any input which doesn't contain the trigger. And our triggers are high entropy, so that image example had 300 bits of entropy. Now, the only way to find our backdoor, um, given that scenario, is to enumerate all possible um, versions of it based on that entropy and knowing the scheme. And that is essentially a password cracking problem, which we have collectively decided is computationally infeasible. And therefore, by the state, same standards, this backdoor is black box undetectable. So OK, it's black box undetectable. Where is it detectable from? So here in this table, we've mapped out um, existing backdoors um, that insert the backdoor in different parts of the pipeline and plotted out where in that pipeline they are detectable from. Now the important thing here, the columns are a place that you might look for a backdoor. And in ImpNet, the only columns that are red, which means that it's um, detectable without um, great difficulty, are within the compiler. Now this means that if you're not looking at the compiler, you won't find it. The only question mark there um, is that yellow box, 21, which is the compiled machine code. Now we tried decompiling a model that had had, had this backdoor inserted, and in tens of thousands of lines of decompiled C, only a few hundred of them had changed. And without having had a reference of, well, here's it without the backdoor, we would never have known which ones to look for. So we say that that is extremely difficult in practice. Now, there are some defenses you might use, um, but they're very fragile. So you can't find the back door um, when you're at, te at, at test time before you've deployed the model. But in deployment, well, you might do this thing. Um, well, there are various defenses based on stochastic preprocessing. So this is anything where before the input actually reaches the model, it's uh, pre-processed in some stochastic way such that um, the person who's inserted the backdoor can't predict um, what is going to happen after that pre-processing and thus the trigger is, is removed. Now, this obviously has an accuracy cost um, and you have to do it on every input at deploy time. This isn't something you can use to detect the backdoor, it's just something that you can use to mitigate the presence of triggers um, at deploy time. Now, the second thing you might do is very similar to that, except you actually run the model twice. 
once with that pre-processing and once without that pre-processing. And um, if without the pre-processing there was a trigger, then you'll see a very big change in what the output was. Um, this obviously has an efficiency cost because for every input at deploy time, you have to run the model twice. And you can't do any optimizations there because if you're optimizing it to run it twice, then there's a compiler going on and it could just insert the backdoor there. So it has to be at least twice as expensive computationally. Now, both of these, there is actually a not very difficult counterattack, um, which is to uh, use an error correcting code in the trigger, uh, maintain its high entropy, but make it robust to noise. Um, so you might uh, put it in the frequency domain with an error correcting trigger, and we believe that that would make um, both of these defenses not robust at all. So, okay, what do we do <laughs> if the, the, uh, the defenses aren't very good? Well, in 1984, um, Ken Thompson, who was giving a talk about a traditional uh, compiler backdoor, said, the moral is obvious, you can't trust code that you did not totally create yourself. Now, this is wildly impractical, clearly, but what I would say is you especially can't trust code you can't even read yourself. So don't accept a compiler that is proprietary and you can't audit unless it's been audited by someone you trust um, at that company, presumably. Now to conclude, um, I'm happy to take questions. I'd really like it if um, you could scan this QR code or go to this website um, to see our sort of taxonomy of the pipeline, taxonomy of existing backdoors. And if you think there's anything we've missed, any new papers since we made it, um, then uh, we hope that it will evolve through contributions.